Okay. Welcome. Welcome to the Chief County Board of Commissioners uh, meeting for 1 p.m. Monday, May 1st, 2023. Uh, well, so we're not having a meeting on Wednesday. Uh, so we're going to go through a process here for citizen input. Any items not on the agenda? Please join us. Just state your name and uh, Greg Brown from the Shrewsboro Woods. And my comment is the fact that the planning commission position for Tumalo, you're, you're having one for that position. And then my question is, if you're having a position for there, why isn't there one for the Shrewsboro Woods, Terrebonne, uh, maybe Alfalfa, Woodside, and some other locations? Because, you know, Tumalo is a small populated area, but, you know, I'm, I'm just asking the question, why aren't the other ones? I know you have seven positions, you know, that would, that would increase it to maybe 10 or 11. So in my, that's my question. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know that we're going to respond to that right now, but I want to thank you for that input. And that's, yes. Yeah, point taken. We used to have nine. Historically speaking, we did have nine. So I think that's what I learned in my research, like in a long time ago. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I, you know, with, with DR, DRW's got almost 6,000 people, and then compared to Tumula, 600 in their in Tumula proper, I know they got more than that in their area, but that's my question. Thank you. There is a real need to, to think about where all the population is in the county and ensuring that people have equal, rep equal representation. Yeah. Uh, across the county in in the planning commission and in other ways. Yes. Chair, if I just may offer just one suggestion, not to get into a discussion, but you might want to raise it in the comprehensive plan update discussions. Just so, so I, they have, you might oh, want to raise it in the comprehensive plan because the comprehensive plan sets the framework for the citizen involvement advisory committee, which is the planning commission for the county. That kind of sets out the boundaries of it. So if you suggest it in that process, then it's something the board could to consider at a later time. Okay, well, okay. I'm, I'm busy at other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. That's what you're seeing. Send, send a quick note in for a cup plan and input. Okay, anybody else? Is there anybody online? So look for the raised hand feature and uh, can you see it? No. Okay. So at this time, uh, next item will be consent agenda. So we do have a legislative set of minutes. We'll hold the consent agenda. A second. Any other discussion? See, you, Commissioner Chang. Yes, Commissioner there. Yes, I was actually not at present on that meeting, the twenty first. So I'm not sure if I should be voting or not. Well, I'll second it then uh, to confirm that yeah, you were. In fact, yeah, I guess that yeah, was the only one there. Yeah, yeah, you weren't there either. So the, the couple of them came pretty quick there, didn't they? Over the weeks. Well, so we'll just acknowledge that. So you, yeah, so in the middle of a vote, do you, do you vote yes? Yes. And I'll vote yes also. Thank you. Uh, so item number two, roundabout art proposal, the US 20 and OB. Uh, Riley and Cook Road. Uh, the campaign. Uh, I'll check. Come on up and. Talk to the board for a minute. Thank you. Uh, introduce you. Uh, afternoon, board. Chris Doty, the department director. As noted in the staff report um, for this item, ODOT is supplying a uh, minimally landscaped uh, center Thank island uh, within the roundabout under construction in, in Tumalo at present. Um, while ODOT does not endorse art um, or propose art within the roundabouts, uh, they do permit it, um, as has been the case in Prineville. And, and, uh, and sisters who've seen the art in those locations. Um, however, that occurs through an IGA uh, with a local jurisdiction. So in this case, it would be uh, the Shoots County uh, rather than you know, a, a city per se, which we're the local jurisdiction. Uh, within uh, Tumalo, a grassroots group has formed uh, to pursue uh, installation of the roundabout, uh, of art within the roundabout that's under construction. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Liz Akar and Ann Witzel, uh, who have developed a concept, and they're really excited uh, to show the board uh, the concept that they feel really represents Tumalo. Um, but with that board, you know, there are some items to, to consider. Um, we're, we're talking about art, 
and the county, you know, basically uh, being responsible for it uh, via an IGA and a, an agreement with ODOT. Uh, so items of concern would be maintenance, of course, uh, long-term maintenance, uh, maintenance that would need to happen if, if it were to be damaged by a vehicle, which is, you know, not uncommon in roundabouts. Uh, liability, uh, part of that process, ODOT will, you know, basically uh, be placing that liability upon us through, we'll be indemnifying ODOT essentially. And then, uh, of course, anytime you're talking about art in the public space, the community process, you know, and, and how, you know, art was picked for that. So with that, um, Cody Smith is actually back at the, the home office, has a video queued up uh, that uh, uh, Liz and, and Ann prepared. And uh, I'm just going to turn the presentation over to you and we'll see if uh, Cody can share his screen and, and get that thing rolling. Great. Liz is you're staring at me like you're you're worried or something. I it's not didn't know happen. if Ann was going to go first or I was going to yeah. go okay. first. Yeah, Cody, yes, we no. are. All right. We we might, if you, Cody, can you put a pause on that, young man? Can you hear us? I, I think so. Yeah. Okay, so maybe if he's, he holds for. Well, you yeah, welcome you to put that up. That's fine. But okay. um, we'd like to just take a few minutes to give you a little bit of background. Um, Thank you for your time this afternoon. Happy May Day. It's nice to have a grassroots effort here during May Day. Our team, at first I'd like to introduce us and other members of our team, um, take a few minutes to just share our vision, the design and approach that we're taking. And then we're really here to ask for your guidance and permission to move forward. First, our team, I'm Ann Witzel. I'm a um, Tumalo resident, farmer, business owner, and I live on White Rock Loop. Liz Aker Willard lives on, on Swally and is a Tumalo resident as well, horse owner. And other members of our team include Chris, he's been an advisor for us throughout, Emerald Shirley, who is a member of ODOT's Senior Transportation Management. She is a, the Senior Transportation Manager for ODOT. Abby Driscoll was guiding us towards Chris. Um, she's still involved as an advisor. Um, she is a uh, Deschutes County Commissioner um, in traffic as well. Uh, Mel Stout, you may have met him previously. He is a uh, landscape architect, former resident and neighbor of Tumalo. And Bob Barco, who is um, recently retired from uh, Tumalo Irrigation District. You may know Bob. He's got a lot of relics that are helping us, um, as giving us options. So our vision was really to have a roundabout for Tumalo that meets all of ODOT and um, Deschutes County requirements and reflects Tumalo's unique character, history, and nature. Um, we also feel that the roundabout is maybe the most visible and first exposure to Tumalo that passersbys may have. So for us, it's, it's, it's nice to have something reflect the character of that area. Um, our, our vision also is to have something low cost, easily maintained, and enjoyable, but also inclusive. So our design has been simple. Um, it reflects uh, the concepts that come up that come up through discussions with a lot of people, including the public review process that took place earlier, just to, about having a roundabout versus an underpass there. We got a lot of comments from the public about what they would like to see or not see. We've also had lots of one-on-ones with business owners and residents around the area. But the concepts are really simple. It's really looking at the agricultural history of Tumalo and the nature of Tumalo. So it's... I, you could call it art. I think it's more reflective of the of the unique character and position of Tumalo. Um, so we think it's really inclusive that way. Um, not much to be offended by, we don't think. <laughs> Always an option, I guess. Um, so our approach has been, as I mentioned, we've learned a lot from others. So many rotaries have been installed in the surrounding areas. We've learned from the people involved with those about their processes. Um, some are much more extensive and elaborate than ours. Um, Sisters, Redmond's, the one that's on Old Ben Redmond Highway and Tumalo, um, didn't really have any um, enhancements, um, but so it's a good, and we've, we're aware of all those different options. Um, Brian Markham, so, so our process included talking with a lot of the folks involved with those, including Marceline Trujillo, who's been involved with the um, City of Bend road roundabouts, which are much more elaborate than what we're proposing. Uh, Brian Markham, you know, is the contractor of the construction company that's involved with constructing the Tumalo roundabout, and he's been helpful, and not only in um, with design, but timing of everything. So we're trying to 
we're coming to you now because uh, the timing is you moving fast on these rotaries, which is really terrific. Um, we want to make sure that we're not holding up any process if there's an installation of something that needs to happen at a certain time. Brian's been really helpful for that. So moving forward, really our design options will show you. Um, we have run them by a number of different people. Mel Stout was very involved with helping design these. And as I mentioned, he's designed the signage posts that are on either side of Tumalo on the north and south entrances of Tumalo. Um, and he has a, the profession of being able to do that, which is terrific. Um, again, we're just tracking all the timelines and the processes for ODOT and, and Deschutes County. So we're abiding by your regulations in terms of visibility, placement, um, timing of installation, et cetera. Um, meeting with you to get your approval and support. Uh, we will have um, a little bit more of a formal public review process what, pending your approval to move forward uh, in early May. And uh, we have to finalize the plans and then confirm again the timing and placement and installation. And, um, really, that's it. We're here to share our thoughts with you, get your input and guidance, and hopefully your approval to move forward. So now, Cody. Can move Cody. <laughs> Hit it. Right this, right. this two minute video will help sh share our plans with you. The images will help you visualize the finished product. Wheel lines. Did you even know what wheel lines were before you came to Central Oregon? Tumalo signs were designed and built by Mel Stout. 2013, incorporating wheel lines and natural elements. I forgot. That's okay. That's okay. The roundabouts are everywhere. Yes, they are. Any moment now, the roundabouts are everywhere. They range from plain to elaborate. They save lives. They reduce pollution. And they're here It's a little blurry. Okay. The Primeville BLM has given us juniper to split and form rock cribs and split rail fences. Many of Deschutes County trailheads use these features. Split juniper was crucial to early farming pioneers. My favorite, of course, always, always. Just a little bit of light. The wheel lines. No, they're not abandoned bicycle wheels. Wheel lines are ubiquitous to hay fields, and our wheel line segment would be cemented PVC and fixed to the base. They are aluminum. Antique hay rake. Again, engineered to the base. Post to the features, the ever popular ditch and fence ladder for hopping fences and ditches. I passed you out all a copy of Mel's ideas. Nothing's carved in stone except the stone that the Mel contractor will leave. So thank you very much for considering us. And I don't know if this looks familiar to you, but I would like to see one very soon from all of you. <laughs> it's an approval. Thank it's you. Like a county administrator signature on that one. And it's Tom Anderson, county administrator. How long ago was that? Depends on how yeah, I was here for, in this position for eight years. <laughs> okay. well, a window. There's a window. You know, assume that's probably for the um, existing. Yes, that was for the original uh, ones. Side. We'd like to see another. So we're apparently you know, jurisdictionally, so, uh, the jurisdictional authority that, that lent our, our approval to that at some point in the past. So, so it's an ODOT project in ODOT right away in our community, and we're the local jurisdiction that would partner 
with the community to put our in a, in a roundabout. Um, I'm just thinking, you know, what are the business case here? And then, uh, you know, setting something in place, uh, then, you know, either maintenance, um, an accident or vandalism, you know, how, how do we deal with the variables that kind of are around that? Yeah. Uh, so I think, you know, that's kind of the business case we've learned today a little bit, partnership. Yeah. yeah, and I didn't. I really didn't mention that our uh, one of our visions we did um, is to keep this really low cost. So we don't have a huge fundraising um, desire. We certainly can do it. We have people lined up to contribute, and and if needed, we're really hoping that a lot of our the artifacts, the agricultural things, are donated. We have our eyes on a lot of them, and so we're working that angle. Um, as you could put little. Um, Donated by? Yes. No, you can't. You can't. I don't think you can. Oh, no, chapter 16, page 35. Really? No lettering unless it's Got off it. the roundabout. Yeah. Really? Even teeny. Okay. Well, you know, then they'd have to break to look at it. There may be another place we could put Where, some there are absolutely. acknowledgments in town. Of We've been told, let us know what you need. We're willing to help. We'll see what happens when push comes to shove. No, I, I love what you guys have done. So I will be driving through it every day. And yeah, that's really you. Yeah, oh, good. It's just, it's yes. perfect. Good. Well, I you. think Mel's ideas and, and Liz's and everyone's, it's all come together. So maintenance, um, we really are still working on that ongoing maintenance. I've done similar, very large scale projects in the Portland area previously, and we've worked with the surrounding businesses and they've all really enjoyed being involved with ongoing maintenance, whether it's litter or whatever, whether we, we're, we're working on that right now and hope that happens. Don't have all the answers buttoned up yet, sorry. <laughs> well, and it's, it's like we're starting a partnership and it'll yeah. basically be there forever. So it's really setting us up for the next the next people that will, That's right. who's gonna fix that or exactly. who's gonna clean that up? Well, the plan is according to this piece of paper, you know, that's, that's what exactly right. Towards. Thank you. Yes, right. We, we realize that. And so we're still working on that. So maintenance for us is huge. Um, contributions are what we're hoping for. We do have backup fundraising plans. Um, and as I said, we'd love to go the next step to have a little public gathering at the Timolo Cider Company. They're ready to host us and have everybody involved to just look over the plans and, and enhance in some way. But um, we thought we'd come to you first. So then, uh, when you're talking about not making it uh, making it inexpensive, is there kind of an estimate already of costs? Or? We need to get um, engineering requirements, um, and that's really going to be our costs uh, to secure things so that they are not uh, that they're secure. So building them into a display, yeah, mm -hmm. static display, yeah. But otherwise, it's pretty low maintenance. Um, even you know, everything, I think, it just has to be engineered in the right way. And that's where um, Markham is really going to be helpful, helping us do that. I think the elements that you just described are, are really great. I mean, okay. those are historically significant pieces of, of the history of this area. Um, as you were describing it, it, it almost struck me like we were talking about a museum exhibit hmm. in, you know, in some ways, like, a, hmm. you know, it's, a, yes, it's artistic, but I mean, the, you know, these are you know, some of the things you described are artifacts, basically. Yeah. Right? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've had the chance to work with, with some, uh, you know, uh, uh, people in museum settings in the past, and um, they're, they, they put a lot of thought into how long someone is going to stop and look at look at a display in the way that they put it together. You know, kind of it can be busier when there's when someone's going to stand for a long time and, and look at something. But we're talking about a roundabout where people are going to be driving through you know, like thirty miles an hour. In some cases, I, I, so I, that was my one concern: is like, is this a little too busy for how much how much of someone's visual attention span you've got you, yeah. you're gonna you're gonna have and i so i'm wondering if you um if you have people like that you know mm -hmm. landscape architects or you know like museum curators people like that who are, yeah. are are helping to advise you on kind of like the right amount of elements 
you know, for well, the amount of time. for the amount of yeah. yeah for the amount of you know visual attention span that you get. From That's a really good question, and I think um, one is we want to make sure we're adhering to visibility requirements that you have, so we will not have things tightly jammed, even enhancing to impede any kind of sight from you know visibility from either side. But on your on the density part, you know, Mel. Uh, I don't know if you know that Mel Stout was married to Marcia Stout, who was involved with the Historical Museum for decades. And um, I know he's thought a lot about that in the design that he's come up with. Um, we're because not the, planning the, the to use the pillars are very soon. You know, that's a very they'll be short. Or you know the the, the the pillars the, the, with the with the wheel line is that that is like oh. very it's a very simple design, but yeah. Yeah, it's got a lot to it. Yes. Um, yeah. and, that doesn't stop traffic. I don't think. No, no. <laughs> right, but, but this this no. this sounds more busy to me than than, than that. So the so. artifacts that we've showed, that maybe we <clears throat> should explain that not all of those will be used. They're examples of what we're considering. They're, okay. they're what's been offered. Um, that Bob's been really good about. Parco has been very good about going around to smooth through and get the best <laughs> options. So your point's well taken. I think the design that you have in front of you from now has it pretty well spaced out, but um, we're open to that and we'll certainly keep that consideration. I think there'll just be one hay rake or one small tractor or plow, and then it's gonna be the posts, the stones and posts, um, the juniper posts that, that Liz was talking about, um, the I ladder. I promise that. it won't look like my neighbor's backyard. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you're concerned about. keep it really open, but. We can run the final design. Definitely, we'll run the final design by you. Yes. Well, I mean, but that's what we talk about today. I mean, would you would you want us in a decision space there, or because I think of it as a roundabout art has been talked about for a long time. Uh, there's there's value in having the, the curbs around around roundabout. Uh, you know, something to to know that the roundabout's coming too. You know, yeah. especially the first week it's open when people are like, oh yeah, this used to be straight through. And I think that happened at uh, Ward Hamby, didn't it? We had a big truck. Oh, it has been <laughs> straight through <laughs> for quite a while. Yeah, but we had a truck go on its yeah. side pretty quick. Right? It's Went right through the middle of it. So <laughs> yeah, what you're referring to is kind of called the terminal vista. It's primarily uh, for uh, nighttime. Yeah. Uh, so it's a, you don't you have something to break up headlights. Yeah. And that, that lets people know. You can't see that it's there. Been down that road many times. But you'll be oh. doing that. You'll, that's your construction decision, right? I'm going to involve that piece. Right. I mean, everything you're proposing adds to that. Oh, oh that's fine with what they've designed, um, which is pretty minimal and very similar to Ward Handy. <laughs> uh, well, so I was just getting, you know, who's, who gives a final blessing here? I mean, you're saying you want us to look at it, but I. So ODOT has uh, specific requirements on materials. Yeah. Um, so they'll they'll bless uh, one aspect of it from the safety standpoint, but ultimately it's the local jurisdiction uh, that is you know has its name on it. Uh, that uh, you know wants nothing to do with the, okay. the debate of art and, right, and its value. Yeah, right. um, and so I, I think what you're saying is that you're comfortable uh, with the process uh, that's being described here to know that that what comes out of this is what the community has some consensus around. And um, you know, we can all think of, of the roundabout art in this community uh, that has generated a lot of conversations over the years, right? So um, some some generate a lot, some don't. Um, you know, I, what, what they're describing here is is you know, probably uh, fairly acceptable to the majority of, of community well, members. Kind of yeah. Of paint, so. yeah. So I'm just thinking procedural wise, uh, you're proposing community meeting, kind of sharing with the community, uh, a little bit of fundraising to get things mounted uh, professionally, uh, design that, that mounting, and then it'll come back to the board of commissioners meeting, kind of unveil, well, celebrate, and finalize. Is that kind of the idea? I think, do we need a permit? Yeah, so um, the county needs a permit from ODOT, uh, but we also need an intergovernmental agreement that kind of stipulates um just the, the art aspect of it that permits our ability to work in the right of the way um, the iga is hey you're you've got this thing now that you need to own and operate maintain indemnify you know, liability wise and, and certainly that that is a an item of concern um you know given the fact that as it stands today we have no ownership in any of that uh, we're taking on ownership 
as the county, uh, what's our comfort level with that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, uh, any concerns? I mean, it's an exciting project, and this is the beginning of it, so we'll just work our way through the business case. What What is the maintenance plan, or who's uh, like who's well, signing up for that? Yeah, and I think it really depends on what we finally arrive at in terms of the artifacts or the pieces on the site and how they're installed. But as we mentioned, we've been working with Markham Construction because they're going to be putting that big boulder in place there. Um, and they will be very involved with the um, engineering of how things are attached. Um, we're, again, hoping that's going to be donated. We will have to see as we move forward um, what they cover, what we cover in terms of the fundraising. We're not asking you for money. We're we're really just asking for your blessing <laughs> and and involvement as we move forward. What our timeline is such is driven by ODOT and the, and the contractor. We don't want to miss the window for installing things when it's the most convenient for them. So we're trying to get our ducks in order now. And if there's anything we need from you, like a a permit now, even to just to have the contractor install things, then we should probably. Ask for that now. To answer your question, uh, Commissioner Chang, um, we're hoping that we're not going to have a lot of maintenance. We will have it fully insured for the replacement cost. Uh, none of this replacement cost is huge, but we understand that maintenance doesn't end when I do. Maintenance goes on forever. So we're going to have to find a maintenance program, and perhaps we can go back to art in public places. Uh, Marcelina was very helpful, and it would be more economical to ensure replace. Um, so we will have a maintenance plan. Yeah, I mean, I know, like I've, I've built rock cribs and, and, you know, juniper lasts a long time, but not forever. Yeah. So. You know, when it, when a when a post rots out and, and the rocks start falling out, like what's the plan for somebody to come and uh, you know come and rebuild it? And, uh, you know, uh, uh, metal, uh, well, you know, pieces of metal equipment, you know, they get rusty and they, mm -hmm. they um, you know they, they can fall apart. That's so really good points. Point. There's, yeah, I mean, you know, I maybe I'm thinking like 10, 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. but but like a you know, long term long term maintenance plan. Mm -hmm. um, it'd be good to have a. I, I just would love to have a sense of you know how uh, uh, you know this this um, this display will, will be maintained over the long term. If we find that an item that we want to use has a shelf life of ten years, maybe we should consider omitting it. If that's that was my plan for the wheel line to pack it with concrete. Um, uh, aluminum lasts forever until it's crushed, hence the concrete in the middle. Um, Markham's also going to work with us with putting bases, engineering bases, concrete footings that we can attach the pilings with, the posts with, as well as. Um, the hay rake, or if we choose not to use the hay rake, if it looks too busy, like a junkyard, we can leave that out. We can't do anything without your permit. <laughs> I'm I'm comfortable with with proceeding with a permit. I'm I'm just trying to yeah think about all the yeah, contingencies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and. So we understand that it's 20 miles an hour for wind speed. Is, is that still correct? Has anything changed with climate changing or anything like that? 20 miles an hour wind speeds. Okay. I'm sure. sorry. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, um, we'll, we'll figure that out. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And you had a question? Uh, are we making a decision about anything today or is this just consensus to proceed? So what, what I'm gathering is that you're comfortable enough that I can maybe start the process with ODOT while all these details are being worked out. And um, ultimately the IGA will, will come back. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of the permit to work in the right of way, you know, that's going to be a function, you know, if we have a licensed and bonded contractor, 
and uh, you know uh, the county is as the uh, permit holder for MoDOT. Looks like we're getting started. Great. Thank you very much for sharing. Thank you nice for coming. Simple here. line drawing to start it all, right? That's the beginning. There's plenty of room for notes on that. And I see so that Chris, blank. when do you think we might see this just to, as an optimist? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, to see it like when I'm driving into town. December. Go, oh, oh, December. Oh. December. <laughs> December 23, ODOT will have finished right. their, their, their bare naked base. That's the palette on which we have to work with. Okay. By that time, we should have had the large items. We can't put the rocks on if they've placed the curbs. So we'll have, it'll be in stages, but I'm thinking um, end of January, everything should be in place if everybody's communicating. Okay, it's now it's your turn, now it's your turn. You've got two days to finish this. And I, I think it's, it's totally doable. I've never done anything like this before. Anne has, the two of us, are really generating a lot of positive steam <laughs> from the neighborhoods, from the businessmen, from the contractors, and now from the county. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And if you need to make the party bigger, my friends, <laughs> um, the, I think with the cider company is, isn't it? Yeah. It's ha the other side is empty. So where Heritage was. So yeah. yeah. Well, of course. Depending on weather, we'll make it big. Yeah. If you want to make yeah. it bigger, I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm sure I could talk it into it. So oh, we need, yeah. Maybe we need so to much. add more people from the community. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I'm sure they'll welcome yeah, volunteering. Thank you so much. You will be our guest of honor. Oh, thank you. No, no, no. You guys have done a great job. I really, this is what I love. I have a rock card at my house that's from the original ranch. And it is, you know, it's it's really important to keep that heritage going. So thank you for all your vision. Well, thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Thank and you. your support. Great. Yeah. Come to the mall. Oh, good. Another party. <laughs> <laughs> Item number three, uh, IGA with ODOT for all roads, transportation, safety, intersection upgrade projects. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. For the record, Cody Smith, county engineer, also uh, Audio video, video engineer and hey, you did a great job, there. and young man according to some. So yeah, yeah, young man. <laughs> uh, so uh, first of three items I have for you this afternoon uh, is an intergovernmental agreement with ODOT uh, for the All Roads Transportation Safety Intersection Upgrades Project. Uh, so uh, All Roads Transportation Safety. Uh, or ARTS program uh, is, a, is a federally funded program administered through ARTS. Uh, ODOT uh, has uh, uh, allocated some of this money for some intersection safety improvements uh, at and around the O'Neill Junction uh, intersection on Highway 97. Uh, the agreement uh, before you uh, this afternoon uh, would allow ODOT to uh, enter onto county right of way to uh, begin uh, the necessary field work to start designing this project, uh, as well as uh, enter on a county right away to ultimately build the project. Uh, no county funds are, are being uh, proposed uh, for this project. Uh, the project's still in very preliminary phase, uh, uh, very preliminary phase, but in general, the intent of the project is to uh, eliminate uh, through or uh, left turn through movements uh, across Highway 97 at the uh, uh, North Canal Highway 97 intersection, as well as the uh, O'Neill Junction, uh, O'Neill Highway, uh, Bershaw Way, Highway 97 intersection. Uh, so with that, uh, happy to answer any questions. Great, so that sounds like an opportunity for ODOT to come in and uh, do safety, safety work. Other questions? I don't have any questions about this. Is there a motion? Um, so, move approval of a document number 2023 415 
an intergovernmental agreement with the Oregon Department of Transportation for the ro All Roads Transportation Safety Intersection Upgrades Project. Second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, Commissioner there. Yes. Commissioner Chang. Yes. And Chair votes yes. There we go. Next item, item number four, potential award contract for paving. Okay, yeah. So, a uh, second item I have uh, this afternoon. Uh, so the road department prepared bid solicitation documents for the paving of Roslyn Road, US 97 to draft a road project. Uh, scope of work for the project includes uh, paving and reconstruction of Roslyn Road, uh, as well as Tracy Road and Wendy Road, uh, right, right around the, uh, the Wikiup Junction area there near the Gordy's truck stop in Lapine. Uh, department opened bids for the project on April 19th. Two bids were received for the project. Uh, before you this afternoon is a notice of intent to award contract to Taylor Northwest LLC uh, for a total contract amount of $643,672.80. Uh, as always, uh, uh, approval and publishing of the notice of intent to award letter will begin a one week protest period. Uh, and after that protest period, if no protests are received, uh, the contract would be awarded in administratively. And with that, happy to answer any questions. So Cody, I noticed it was a bit above the estimate, um, you know, which a lot of our bids lately seem like they've been under our estimate. So this was the first one. Of, did you expect it to be a touch more? Uh, no, we expected it to be about what we had estimated. Uh, we, uh, I, I guess among, uh, Various things we saw in the bid tabulation: the uh, the paving and asphalt prices, which we had we had estimated to be uh, much higher than what we've seen recently on other projects, uh, just by nature of this being a, a, a fairly small, a relatively small quantity of, of asphalt going down, and, and also just with it being in the southern part of the county, where most of our mixed plants are up uh, towards the northern part of the county. Uh, we had anticipated the, the asphalt prices on this project to be a little higher, but uh, we were a little surprised they're even higher than what we were anticipating. Um, so anyways, yeah. Um, uh, we, we were, I guess, uh, uh, also on the topic of surprises, we were, we were kind of surprised we only had the two bidders. We were expecting a couple more bidders on this one, but Taylor Northwest is uh, delivering uh, a, uh, a sewer line project for the city of Lapine right now. So they, they were kind of uh, in a prime spot to, to get this project. So um, they don't generally participate on more of our traditional paving projects, but here they are. Thank you for the backup. How, how long of a, of a segment of road are we talking about? I mean, you know, in my mind from, from Highway 97 to Rock to, uh, to from, uh, you know, to, to draft or like, that's not that far. No, it's not. Um, I, as far as an exact length, I don't have that off the top of my head here. I'm, I'm quickly zooming in on my GIS map here to measure um, just that particular length of, of Roslyn Road. We are talking about uh, about a thousand feet. Um, on top of that, we've got another uh, approximately 600 feet of Tracy Road and about 400 feet of Wendy Road. Um, but it, uh, the remainder of Roslyn Road is, is something we can fairly easily and, and, and will be fairly easily uh, treating with a, with a chip seal and, and some of the other uh, more routine tools we have in our toolbox. This particular section of road receives uh, uh, a very significant amount of traffic, in particular truck traffic, just by nature of it being right there at the truck stop and some of the other services that are right there um, in that little island there uh, between Tracy, Wendy, and Roslyn Road. So uh, this thing, yeah, this thing seeing truck traffic, you know, 24 hours a day, uh, been, get, been getting beat pretty hard. Uh, last time we did any, any sort of real uh, substantial uh, maintenance work on this was 
approximately seven years ago, I believe. And that was just something we did with our own county forces uh, with cold mix. So it's, this has kind of been a long time coming for this little piece of road, but it's, it's not just, a, I mean, the, the, the name of the project is paving, but it's, there's a lot more. It's not just our, one of our traditional pavement preservation projects. We're basically, for, for most of this, we're, we're completely obliterating the entire roadway, digging it up, building a new road base, uh, putting down some new structure below that, and then and then paving over the top of that. Thanks. So the terminology Lapine Maintenance Zone is that it's referring to basically the city of Lapine, correct? And just the way we wrote it up there. Um, actually, I guess where are you seeing Lapine Maintenance Zone? Uh, background and policy implications on the gender request. I mean, uh, Lapine Maintenance Zone is, is generally everything, uh, basically Sun River South. We've, we've got the county divided up into four different maintenance zones. Um, I wasn't aware we had actually identified Lapine Maintenance Zone on anything in here, but I'm, I'm still. Okay, so oh, I see what you're saying. South County term. Well, I, I just in, referred in to this, in the city of Lapine, so it's our partnership with the Young City still. Uh, and, uh, you know, I do see this. Uh, it, it definitely got. Uh, alligator cracked uh, all through that intersection. There's not much there. And I, I drive it pretty regularly once, once in a while. So a good reconstruction project is is needed. So with that, is there a motion? Um, proof of approval of chair signature of document number 2023-065, a notice of intent to award a contract for the paving of Roslyn Road from US 97 to Drafter Road. Second. Any other discussion? Seeing that commissioner there. Yes. Commissioner Chang. Yes. And chair votes yes. Thank you very much. And then item number five, notice of intent to award contract for Northwest Lower Bridgeway, 43rd Street. Okay. Uh, so uh, the, the intersection of Northwest Lower Bridgeway and Northwest 43rd Street is presently a, a three leg intersection. Um, this intersection is, is a fairly heavily trafficked intersection, it, it being kind of the, the primary entrance into Crooked River Ranch. So, so all traffic that's going from Highway 97 uh, into Crooked River Ranch is going through this intersection. Um, the road department uh, put out a request for proposals for engineering services for uh, uh, making safety improvements to this intersection. Uh, this project's intended to be uh, the first of, of several phases of uh, modernization and safety improvements along uh, Northwest Lower Bridge Way, a uh, project that's identified in the county's current TSP and will be carried forward in the, in the, in the uh, currently uh, draft TSP that, that will be um, uh, with the update that we'll be doing later this year. Um, so road department uh, issued the RFP. Uh, the, the intent of the initial contract, th th this is intended to be a two phase project, this intersection project. The first phase of the engineering services is gonna be uh, evaluating different concepts for intersection treatments at this intersection, uh, looking at the crash history at this intersection and, and the, the, the different factors and mechanisms in those crashes, uh, looking at the different costs, the right of way impacts, uh, this, this intersection is basically completely surrounded by federal land there with BLM. Uh, we also have, have a BPA right of way that goes right through there. So in terms of uh, right of way needs, it's going to be a, uh, anything we're doing here is going to be a fairly lengthy uh, process to secure right of way uh, uh, across federal lands. Uh, so that said, uh, the department uh, received uh, proposals on February 3rd uh, and scored those proposals using a qualifications-based selection process pursuant to state law. Uh, based on this process, Harper Hoff Peterson Regelius Inc. was selected as the top ranked proposer out of the two proposals that we received. Uh, sum summary of the, the proposal scores is included in the agenda packet. Uh, department uh, conducted negotiations with uh, HHPR uh, between March 6th and April 21st. Uh, we now are ready to proceed with award of that contract. So before you this morning, or this afternoon rather, is a notice of intent to award contract to Harper Hoff, Peterson Regalius. And I'm looking now, and I'm, I did not include the uh, 
contract amount in my staff report, it is, it is included in the uh, notice of intent to award letter, but the uh, contract amount for that phase one work is $169,810. So with that, I am happy to answer any questions. So I see the, the uh, three options in the back. So is that part of their application Did each? Did yeah, so, so the, the, those two sheets there uh, in the back of the agenda item in the packet are uh, some of the concepts that ADHPR developed and included in their proposal that we received. So. Uh, in general, the, these are kind of the three options we're going to, uh, with, with this phase one contract that we're going to vet more and evaluate. Um, and uh, uh, at the end of that phase one contract, the intent is to, uh, through, through um, obviously looking at the, the cost estimate, the, the schedule, the uh, safety criteria, um, also probably through some sort of Public involvement process. We'll probably uh, probably looking at doing some type of online open house for this. Uh, in particular, reaching out to the the residents there in Crooked River Ranch. Um, then select the preferred concept. Phase two would be moving towards actual construction plans for that concept, uh, and then and obviously construction of that concept. Uh, so so the intent here is is uh, after some time here. Uh, Hopefully, towards the end of calendar year 24, we'll be coming back to the board with what this is the preferred concept. And now we're ready to uh, engage in, in the phase two contract for the design work. So, uh, Cody, I remember talking to Chris about this something about this road was not as wide as it should be. Is eventually that going to be part of what we're going to be doing in phase two? So, so, uh, so when I'm talking phase two now, I'm just, I'm, talk, I'm just talking about phase two of the design for this intersection. So phase okay. one is coming up with the preferred concept. Phase two would actually be design and construction of that intersection. Meanwhile, th this intersection is, is really the first phase of a multi-phase project we'll be doing on Lower Bridge Way, which, yes, will include uh, modernization, safety improvements, widening of the road. Uh, Lower Bridgeway being part of the state scenic bikeway there, among other things. Um, so, yeah. So when is that going to be possibly happening? Um, we don't have exact timelines laid out on that. This, this, is, this is kind of the first one because this is going to be the, the biggest one. This is the one where we're really seeing the, um, the, the potential that there's going to be some right-of-way acquisition. And, and because it's going to be through some sort of federal process, we're, we're anticipating that to be a fairly lengthy process. So, so this is this is kind of first out the door. The intent is is after we get this one, um, you know, more or less in the hopper, then then we'd start looking at how we're going to uh, keep continuing west with those improvements on Lower Bridge Way. Thank you, Cody. How um, what kind of assumptions about uh, growth and traffic? Uh, increasing, uh, you know, the uh, daily trips increasing, are, are we using as we design this? I mean, there's still a lot of open, there's there's still a lot of uh, unbuilt lots in Crooked River Ranch. Um, we're, we're certainly seeing a lot of interest in uh, people doing, doing new things out in the Lower Bridge Valley. Um, are we, are we building for the future or are we, are we, thinking about what, what we're seeing right now and trying to build for that. Oh yeah, building for the future is definitely gonna be part of this phase one uh, uh, process here. Look, looking at, yeah, looking at full build out in Crooked River Ranch, looking at, you know, build out for other, you know, potential um, areas further out Lower Bridge Way that, that, that might, you know, at some point, you know, we've, we've already got one fairly large area here that's gone through a rezone, although it doesn't, necessarily, at least at this time, have direct connectivity to Lower Bridge Way. Uh, but yeah, looking at the other potential development scenarios uh, further west along Lower Bridge, um, and, and on, just on top of that, what the, what the future um, regional traffic model is going to look like and the potential for you know, any other um, uh, trip dis distribution that would occur on Lower Bridge Way over a 20-year horizon period. Thanks. 
So we have the notice of intent to award contract. Is there a motion? I'll move approval of chair signature of document number 2023-067. I notice of intent to award a contract for engineering services for the Northwest Lower Bridgeway slash Northwest 43rd Street intersection improvement project. A second. Any other discussion? Seeing that, Commissioner Chang? Yes. Commissioner Dare? Yep. And chair votes yes. Thank you very much, Cody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item number six, continuation of board discussion of planning commission appointment. Afternoon, commissioners. Peter Kutowski, community development director. Just following up on Wednesday's conversation, uh, where uh, at on that day, uh, Kelsey Carson was appointed by the board of county commissioners to fill the Tumalo area vacancy. And now staff is looking for direction on how you want to proceed uh, as it pertains to an at-large position. Uh, as noted on page two of the memorandum, in coordination with legal counsel, there are two options for proceeding. Uh, we had talked about uh, for a, a few meetings about the opportunity to re reallocate Commissioner Hovecamp's seat who is currently, he's currently fulfilling uh, a partial term and in uh, at large shifting Nathan Hovecamp to the Bend area, uh, which would, as noted in the memorandum, allow Commissioner Hovecamp to receive a full four-year term. That would then uh, make available a four-year term for an at-large uh, opening. Uh, the other option is noted in option two is C Commissioner Hovecamp stays in his existing seat, fulfills the term that was vacated by Les Hudson, and we cancel the uh, at-large recruitment and go forth and immediately recruit for a Bend Area position. And just so the commission knows, that would mean for a period of one year, you would have three people living in the Bend Area, two, two at-large and excuse me, two Bend area and one at large. So staff is looking for commissioner uh, direction at this time. Tentatively, May, May 12th uh, is the date that's been set aside for the three commissioners to interview candidates uh, who've expressed interest uh, for the at large position. So we have our planning commissioner terms uh, memo here and we're referring to the Tumalo seat, but really this was previously an at-large seat. Correct. Uh, just the terminology now we're, kind of, we're using different. Correct. And it was the sections on the map of our Deschutes County uh, area map saying, to the best of our ability, selecting somebody from that area. So I'm just, are we going to change the terminology now, I guess? I don't know if that's guidance that you would get from us or just... I don't think that there's a need to change the geographic representation. As noted in the footnote one, the board today, you know, is committed to geographic representation to the extent possible for the last 12 to 15 months. There has been uh, a, a genuine, uh, you know, effort from Tumalo area residents to respectfully have a representative, representative uh, on the planning commission. And so Dale Crawford's term limits, uh, uh, he's term limited effective uh, June 30th. And so that that at large vacancy was used to allow Kelsey Carson to fill it, but to fall under the Tumalo area um, designation. That's referring to the future. So we're still gonna call it an at large seat. Like two years from now, if we pull out the book and say, okay, here's, here's the seat's appointments, it's gonna be called at large. Uh, terminology is around. Two years from now, uh, well, a year from now, um, what we know now, to one, one year from now, you will have one at-large position to fill, and uh, as well as um, this, as well as a bend area position in in in, uh, in June uh, uh, on June thirtieth of twenty twenty four. So, Commissioner Altman's seat would be she's eligible for a second term to the extent that the board was supportive of that. Um, but with Kelsey Carson's recent, recent appointment, you, the board has gone from two at-large planning commissioner positions to one. 
in, I think what Commissioner Devon was asking is, is how are we going to label that seat that, that uh, Kelsey Carson is going to hold? That's, I, I, I would call it a Tumalo area seat. That's good for yeah, four years. Time we publish a matrix like this. Correct. Effective. I gave you. I gave you the the, the table yeah. as it stands yeah. today. That was, that's uh, exactly where I was yeah. Thinking. On July first, it would yeah. it would show Kelsey Carson yeah. as a tumbler. Sorry if I was slow to take. And so, what we're trying to, to determine today is uh, how we will fill the second vacancy that is that is going to be opening up on the, on the planning commission, and whether we're going to follow through on that plan to shift um, Nathan Hope Camp over to a Bend area seat, freeing up an at-large seat, Correct. or whether we want to keep him there for this final year and, and then um, proceed, you know, pull back the at-large solicitation that we did and, and move forward with a Bend area solicitation. That's exactly correct. <clears throat> My thoughts? Yeah. Oh, gee. Um, let's see. I would say leave Commissioner Hope Camp at his at large and shift to um, bringing someone from Ben that's um, for it would be a four year appointment, correct? That is correct. For Maggie C. So uh, switching gears from, from where we were. Previously, that's what he'd be proposing. Yes. I mean, he was appointed for that seat for two years. So um, I remember um, to quote Peter, he said that would be uncharacteristic to switch him to uh, two years if he went to bed. So I'm saying, okay, then let's leave him where he is and let's bring another Ben person in. If he was uh, appointed for at large, leave him at at large. But, but we've run, I mean, we've run a solicitation for an at-large seat operating under the assumption that we were going to uh, make that move. Um, and, you know, a number of a number of people put in through their hat in the ring uh, for an at-large seat. And uh, um, I don't feel very good about um, essentially canceling that solicitation right now. And, and um and then you know, telling all those people, thanks for spending the time to to, to you know do your homework and, and research this and throw your hat in the ring and fill out an application. Um, but you know that's on pause now, and we're going to go and we're going to look for a, a bend area person. Well, uh, I said last week if we move Nathan to the bend, I didn't want to make it a four year. I said he was in, he was originally nominated for two years, so and. Um, there was some question about that. So that's why I changed what I was saying last week. Well, uh, I'm supportive of putting Nathan in that Bend area seat, uh, just like we had proceeded to. Uh, you know, this is uh, a point where we're gonna get this all stabilized. July 1st will be you know, a couple of people in there. Uh, and so then the question, uh, if somebody's fi finishing up a two-year term and then getting appointed to a four-year term, what does it look like four years from now or six years from now? I mean, total of eight years of uh, serving. Great well, question. The important thing is we need, to, uh, we need to have our term staggered. And so that's why I'm saying if he moves over, he still should have that staggered term because um, I believe that's what we're really doing. We only have so many people a year that are replaced. Yeah, the staggered terms are, to Commissioner Harris' point, you're always going to have some overlap. The goal is to try to have a, have a, always have a quorum. Um, to uh, your point, uh, Mr. Chairman, the way the code reads, you're allowed, you can, you're allowed uh, you, two full full terms. Um, and, and the code speaks to if one has a, I don't have it exactly memorized, but if you've inherited a partial term, you're eligible for two full terms. But there's also a provision to the extent that there was a major project that uh, 
the planning commission was involved in and you had commissioners that were about to term out, the board could at its discretion allow those commissioners to continue serving until that project went through their purview. But as it pertains to Commissioner Hovecamp, he, as I read the code, he would, I mean, I'm not trying to be presumptuous, but he, he would be entitled to a four-year term for the Bend area. And then if the commission so, cho so, so chose in 2027, he would be eligible for a second term. But that's, I don't want to get, you know, I'm trying to but speak for this board. That's it is possible and it's happened in the past. Peter, based on what you just said, uh, theoretically, then we could actually extend either Dale or Maggie uh, because we're right in the middle of a comp plan. Yeah, a pretty significant project. I mean, that, that is true. I mean, I, the comp plan update won't. Uh, it, technically, that's true. Um, the The sensitivity that staff had was more for the mule deer inventory. And you remember, staff went to the board to get direction on the on the mule deer. And there was enough time in the spring to ensure that hearings could take place, and there'd be ample time for deliberation. I don't, and I and I do think that the planning this current planning commission will be able to give a recommendation to the board by the end of June. Uh, the comp plan update, the hearings process won't kick off until late fall, so it's hard for me. The board could certainly rationalize if you wanted to 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 keep uh, the two existing commissioners that turned out, but the way I've always conceptualized it, it's it's a project that's in evidentiary hearings. Uh, ongoing and they're staring at their term limit that's just a few weeks away or um, and in that respect you know staff could come back to the board and acknowledge hey they're, they're still in uh, in hearing mode or they're about to deliberate with the board consider extending their term to allow deliberations to be fulfilled uh, just for just for a little just bit. for a narrow margin, but the comp plan update, I don't again, I don't see us initiating the legislative amendment until uh, late fall, so it really doesn't apply. Just, but, to, sorry, go ahead, please. just to add on, it the code does specifically say that that lim it's limited to six months. Yes, Thank you for the short term. term. Well, it like I mean, you know, one one additional thought that came to mind was, you know, if that was, if that, if that gave us a year, then we could, um, we, we might be able to figure out something with with uh, the the Bend area seat and and uh, this at large seat for a year from now. Six months is six months. Well, as I've said in the past, I mean, I want to have the first opinions at the table there, um, and I do support, and I had selected Nathan uh, for the planning commission, so I'm comfortable putting him in that bend seat uh, for a four-year term. Uh, you know, we'll see what happens after four years from now, and that's the future, uh, which gets us on our path that we had been working through. So, and I, um, that really bothers me. He. Um, definitely, he's um, was a member of Central Oregon Land Watch, and um, I just feel like if you want a diverse group of people, I would prefer um, having him on for another year and then going with someone else. So anyway, uh, I think it's really important to look at the way that uh, planning commissioners have acted. Um, since they were appointed, um, and Nathan Hofkamp has uh, given me no concerns about uh, the way he's implementing uh, you know, the duties of a planning commissioner. In my mind, the planning commissioner is there to um, to help the county engage with the public, to do a lot of listening, um, to learn to learn code, to learn the law and uh, provide us with the, the most balanced, reasonable recommendations that they can. And, and um, as far as I can tell, that is exactly what Nathan Hovkamp has been doing, regardless of whether he has uh, an affiliation with Landwatch or not, which, which he has uh, um, 
ended and notified us that he has ended. I would support that. But I was given the impression he'd already ended that relationship when he first ran. And apparently he hadn't at that time. So I, you know, I have a different opinion. So let's, should we put this on the minutes now or the vote? I mean, I, I, I would see, we're, we're going to do sure. what we were going to do. Now we're going to. I would recommend a motion on the vote. Uh, I, I move appointment of Nathan Hopkamp to uh, a Bend Area Planning Commissioner seat uh, for your term. And I'll second it. Uh, any other discussion? Seeing that, Commissioner Chang? Yes, Commissioner Jerry? No. And Chair votes yes. Say, uh, this is the world we live in. I want to see these uh, discussions at the Planning Commission, too. Different opinions are okay. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. We'll, we'll proceed now with uh, the at large interviews as well. Correct. And, um, I did see your email. We'll, uh, we'll I'll, I'll work with, I'll work with uh, Brenda on, on calendar holds and all of that. But uh, in terms of uh, the candidates that are interviewed from two to five on the on May twelfth. So more to come. Uh, and uh, both the chair and vice chair of the planning commission are planning on participating, so we don't have a public meeting. So thank you for this direction and I'll get that set up uh, immediately or finalized in terms of logistics. Great, thank you. Thank you. Next item, uh, follow up for video lottery fund allocation. Greg. Greg. Your best. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, you might not need oh, it. I but... got one. I got outside. Yep. <laughs> Who knows what's coming? Oh, great. Nice, 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 nice big format. Yeah. <laughs> Pull up that same yep. spreadsheet. Good. We'll get it. I'll get it to the. Well, I think it might have kicked me out when I came in. So we have a work with our uh, video lottery allocation. Spreadsheet for an annual review. There it is. Okay, perfect. All right, for the record, Stephanie Robinson, Administrative Services. I'm here again this afternoon to review anticipated revenue from the county's portion of video lottery proceeds and continued development of the expenditure plan for FY24. I was planning to just start working in the spreadsheet, but first wanted to ask if the board had any questions or follow-up items from last week. Okay, so meeting with Nick today, did you say that we can do the campaign feasibility? Can that all be moved off of this statement, right? If the board supports that okay. decision. Right, there's actually that campground fund, 800,000 balance. So we could take that um, 100,000. We actually paid for it in 23. Can we reimburse that and move it over? The our plan. Um, yeah. If the board is supportive to allocate fiscal 23 and 24 charges to a fund. Yeah, that'd be a great idea. My uh, I would support that. It's a, it's, a, it's a parks program development fund. Um, and uh, this campground feasibility study 
can help us uh, essentially create the anchor piece uh, for two or more parks uh, in the county. And um, I, I think it's a very appropriate place to draw uh, the funds for uh, for the feasibility study. We have a little bit more introduction on that fund itself. You know, how does it get funded? How, how much money has been going into it in the last few years? I don't have that at my fingertips. Um, I could speak generally, but I think it'd be best to follow up with you with a little bit more detail on the actuals that have come into the fund over the years. Uh, yeah, so I guess I add to that just to follow up from this okay. discussion. And definitely, uh, but so it's Fund 130, which is park acquisition and development. And it's for you may know. I'll spot. go grab a budget. Okay. I just I know about this fund from when I was at the park district in the pine before the pine was the city. And I asked for money out of this fund, and I think we even got a couple tens of thousands of dollars, you know, maybe forty thousand or sixty thousand dollars out of it from the um, county. From the county, from this fund of the county when I was on the park district board for uh, park improvements in, in the unincorporated community of La Pine back in the day. So as I say, I just happened across this fund 15 or 17 years ago. So I don't know if anybody checked the minutes or not, but the sister chamber, I, I thought we'd approve that 50,000. We just weren't going to give them to them last year. Did we check those minutes? Well, uh, so getting back to that one, so you're yeah, going up and down on the spreadsheet here, but I, I support that allocation. Uh, are you supportive of that? You know, different, different topic then, sisters. I, I, we're gonna. Are we gonna come back to the parks, or we're just? We're just uh, well, yeah, so we can get up the forging ahead. Well, she's okay. yeah. She just mentioned that, so now she's. Uh, I mean, going morning. up, going back to that that whole bracket. Um, I I believe that that that, that package of three at Co, uh, the Sun River Chamber and the Sisters Chamber that we. Um, uh, yeah, somebody open that door. It's, it's locked on the outside, so I should unlock it. This is our public meeting and people can join us. There we go. I was going to say, I, I good, excellent timing, John. <laughs> I was going to say, on, on all three we of these. We weren't going to cut anything from On all, all three of the. Well, I, I, I was going to, I was going to say that I, I support a, an increase for Enco, but I maybe not that this big of an increase. Um, and I think we need to, we need to, um, uh, tighten our belts on those two chamber, uh, those three chamber requests, essentially. Um, these, we have a lot of demands for these lottery funds. There are, um, there are a lot of ways to support economic development. One of my goals is for us to, to reach a place where we could actually use some of these lottery dollars uh, to support workforce workforce housing initiatives. Um, and I don't see how we do that without just being very, um, very frugal across the board with all of our existing categories uh, and, and making it a priority. Uh, so specific line items then, uh, we're, it was mentioned sisters chamber general operations is that a yes or no or for the number i'm supportive of it. Yeah. support a smaller amount i thought we'd already approved it does anybody have access to those minutes well it, we, can we had said we'd now. give 75 then and then we said i mean if we already said we would do it i don't want to renege on something we've already agreed to so I'm pretty sure we didn't make a multi-year commitment. So I mean, now is the decision. Commissioner, you support that? Right, I support it. But I yeah, thought so we already had. So if there's two, if there's two votes, let's, then yeah, let's work our way through this, and we'll fully we'll see the balance because that's it. This is our board of commissioners allocation, and if we start going way over, we can so we could add the fifty-eight that we funded that we're going to transfer around to, <clears> so then we really have one hundred eighty thousand. If you want to okay well so put that back in so the beginning networking yeah let's work just work simply down the spreadsheet and then get to the numbers just so we're clear here so it was general two to one support for sisters 
Chamber General Operations 5000, yeah. Uh, for Sun River, I've always been supportive. Um, I'm hesitant to support, support the Shop Sun River campaign. Uh, you know, Christine Thomas said that these are the great dollars I get to go promote things with. Uh, but yeah, this is where I would I would tighten the belt a little bit, as in you know support their general operations, but not the next project dollars. Well, we need those businesses, and as Jim Pfister said, if we don't support them, they're not going to have the businesses in the community. And to repeat, Sun River is providing. 73% um, of our room tax revenue career this year today. So uh, I would I would do 10,000 and hope she can, you know, do something with that amount of money. Do you support anything? I would support five to 10,000. <coughs> As I say, I'm comfortable not supporting it. Uh, so we're going three different ways on this one. So we have two, five, well, we have 10, so between, 10 and five. between 10 and zero, there's five. I, I guess I would pitch five. Here we go. So I'm pitching 10. So do they get 7,500? No, you, you, you pitch 10, you pitch zero, I pitch five. So I'm trying to split the difference. So 5,000? That has support. Better than nothing. Um, to segue the board's process, uh, but we have followed yeah, so up. Okay, like so now we're going to go back to the parks session. fund. Yeah, it's, it's fund 1 and 30. It's, the funds can only be used for county designated parks or future park planning. The revenue comes from uh, primarily from the RV park apportionment funds from the state, and we've been budgeting about $300,000 in revenue each year. And then the majority of it is transferred to the RV park. It's about $190,000 $190, each year that's been going to the RV park. And that's why there's a balance because we've been getting about $300,000 in, about one ninety dollars going out. The other fund that, that sounds similar to it is the park development fees. That's what I was referring to. So it wasn't. Yeah, that's in lieu of donating land for park development at the time of subdivisions. Uh, uh, developers contribute to that. So then that, yeah, so it was a different fund than this 130 that I was involved in 17 years ago or so before there was a city of Vermont because there was those development plays and there was uh, in lieu of parks. So that's, that's exactly what I was yeah. the other The other one is basically a S SDC buyout. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, good. So now we know more about that and um, uh, so the line item for this one, if we go back to the bottom again, so the, uh, the Northwest contract mount. So um, camping feasibility study, the balance. Uh, so the proposal is, yeah, to fund 100,000 for that to offset both of those mounts. Correct. Right. So yeah, sure. To Adair had identified that it'll increase the beginning networking yep. capital, which I think stuff may already adjusted. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, and we also put over that. Okay. Now let's start off where yeah, where we need to go from top to bottom here. Or what is do we have any I guess the, the only other thing I'd say about that is that that leaves us a healthy amount if the feasibility study looks really good and we want to use some of those dollars for the actual capital capital construction costs. It's one of these part concepts. So 125,000. So I see Christine just came in. So 45,000 dollars base support and uh, negotiated 5,000 instead of 20,000 is what we just to discuss we had just before we walked in the door. So just letting you know. Okay. Any other kind of blank slots? Fuels reduction and the United Way. Yeah. It's a fuel reduction program. I got, I got a little bit more information about the Oregon State Fire Marshal um, funding that um, may come our way through the grant writing efforts of Oregon Living with Fire and their. It, it does sound like some of those dollars could be available to fulfill a similar function to these fuel reduction grant. Uh, 
these fuel reduction grants. Um, doesn't sound like it could replace $100,000, uh, but it could replace some. So, um, I will go back to, to uh, proposing again $50,000 in this category. And my conclusion is I'd like to put something in there because any of these little dollars can really trigger somebody, you know, because they're pretty flexible dollars also. So uh, 50000 has been proposed. Um, what to do when we put 80000 again in United Way? What does it leave us with a balance in step? We just first two steps ahead of the numbers. Well, I just want to know. I'm backing in. I said 20, and I don't want to go above it if, if that really doesn't. So, where are we have at the bottom? Oh, oh, for the balance, I have it up here, so it's easy to see. 45,000. 45, oh, so yeah. we could do 45,000. Is that everything then? 264? Um, so, I put in the 80 here. Right. The fuels reduction is still open. This includes adding back in the 58 um, right. for camping. Okay, so we still we could put in the 45,000 then there instead of 50,000 mm -hmm. for the grants. There you go. I, yeah, I support that. So now we're getting spreadsheet finalized. If we leave the 80 in United Way, and I think I think we are I don't think anything else we want to go back. I really don't want to change the echo numbers. Um I want John's people to be able to afford to live here and work here and what they do. I think that's important. So I don't know, unless you want to change the echo, reduce their funding. Well, let's talk about so the affordable housing trust fund. Um, it's you know a million dollar ask. Uh, I it's a million dollar ask. Well, big money ask. Uh, Three hundred thousand was the number that we were just kind of toying around with, where it could be the scope of a good starting point. And I, I, I think that's a good number, as in that gives enough uh, you know runway to go do something for you know maybe 10, 10 uh, development opportunities. This is my thought process. So do do you like that scale or scope of the starting point? I think I, I'd like to see a bigger scale. I think um, there's going to be a huge amount of setup um, in you know, to do that program and to do that for just three hundred thousand dollars, 10 units is, is a whole lot of work. Uh, you know, creating a program with not a whole lot of funding to, to deploy. So I'd, I'd like to see us get to something more like a five hundred thousand dollar level. I think Nick was talking today about uh, the housing trust fund that we had an access to. I don't know if you've had that meeting with him or not, but he was saying that there's an economic loan fund of six hundred thousand, and maybe we could take half of that. Is that well, is that actually, different money? You're, you're exactly right, but I was wrong that it's not six hundred. The balance of that fund is just three hundred twenty-four thousand. Okay. So, and I have not had this this conversation with. Uh, Edco, what I uh, asked uh, Robert, our CFO, and William, just to identify if the board is interested in funding uh, the housing trust fund, which is intended for workforce housing, are there any other options for the board to consider? And the, those two options, one would be uh, the uh, discretionary interest that we have in our ARPA fund account, um, which is ballpark $300,000. Or if the board, and again, we haven't discussed this with EDCO to understand the impacts to them, but uh, there is $324,000 in uh, fund 050, which we've used for the economic development loan uh, program in the past. So another option for the board would be to utilize the $300,000 um, one time or whatever the board choo chooses this year for workforce housing. I'm just going to say the thing we hear the number one issue for employers is housing. And so that I think the board can make a, a choice either today or in the future. You don't have to decide that. Today. And there's actually a balance carry forward of ARPA funding that has not been allocated at 412,000. Right. Yep. The interest. Yeah. In no. to the interest. No, oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 you're right. The balance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we can't use that for workforce housing initiatives because uh, ARPA is only eligible for uh, 80%. AMI and lower. So, uh, and I'm not opposed to uh, taping, taking our uh, beginning fund balance next year down for this purpose interest also. Interest 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 the, the okay. beginning fund balance that we're talking about, uh, one point, you know, a million dollars or whatever the number is going to be, one point something million. I don't mind, you know, talking about starting with some of these dollars also. Uh, we're, we dialed that in pretty well with our uh, current allocations. Uh, we could dial it even back more, but I don't know if we need to. Um, but 
but yeah, I'm just saying we, we I'm, I'm pretty, I'm okay with these allocations. I would say, I guess my proposal would be to take, to go into the main working capital um, here um, for the lottery funds, uh, $300,000 and then take $200,000 of those American Rescue Plan interest dollars that we have to get to 500,000. I think the, and you may already have this information, Commissioner Chang, just so the full board has it. Um, the ARPA interest could be used to buy down debt for the courthouse, whereas something like the 050 balance, it, technically, I guess you could use either option, but the courthouse, the ARPA interest could be more easily applied to buying down that courthouse debt. Um, correct. The, um, O five O has primarily been funded through transfers from Fund One Sixty Five Video Lottery, so it's more closely tied to this type of an allocation in terms of where the dollars originated from. Well, maybe I would revise that then. And, and, um, yeah, I went back and I looked pretty carefully at uh, at the numbers and the, 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 the graphs in the presentation that Stephanie provided for us. Thank you. Um, last time. And as far as I can tell, the beginning networking capital, the reserves for lottery dollars, it, it hasn't been near a million dollars. Um, but for like the last couple of years, because of the, um, uh, you know, the, the you know, appropriate thank you fiscal discipline of, of board commissioners in the fiscal year 20 and 21. Um, you know, it, it, if I if I read correctly, in fiscal year 2021, that the, the reserve amount was only six hundred thousand dollars at that point. Um, so to go back down, kind of into that into that neighborhood at this point, it, you know, it's, it's not um, it's not like we're we're burning down a reserve that has been a million dollars for many years. We're, we're basically just reverting back to reserve levels from just a couple of years ago. So, so what's your thought? Take it much out of here now? Or? I, my original proposal was 300,000 from here and 200,000 of those are by, um, are, you know, are by dollar interest earnings, but um, if those are much more flexible than these dollars, then maybe we want to save some of those and and um, I would suggest a larger, a larger amount from from bidder, the lottery being working capital. There. You mean taking the balance lower is what you're saying you want to do? Yes. Um, We're getting that working capital next year. This video lottery. I think we need to keep it where it is. I think. As, as recently as fiscal year 2021, the reserve was only $600,000. So, you know, I'm just suggesting. I know we haven't had an interest rate. Um, let's see, what are we getting at, at the end of this week? So, um, I don't know. I would just like to be conservative for a while longer. So, what about do you support coming up with some uh, dollars for affordable housing trust fund? Right. Like yeah. the amount of 300,000. 300, numbers that we've been talking about. Um, yes, we can find 300,000 somewhere. You're saying there is 324,000. Is there a problem with using all of that one? Essentially, if you were to move, allocate $300,000 out of fund 050, there'd be a smaller amount remaining for potential future economic development loan applications through EDCO. And I think that would be a discussion for the board to have right. at that time about if you, what you thought the um, the next steps would be related to that fund and its balance. That's pretty low, isn't it? Well, uh, so for clarity, I mean, I support, as I said, that 300,000 number, it's just a starting number, it could be different, but uh, I don't, I, maybe we just need to bring this as an agenda item to get an update from the person, you know, the group that's uh, advocating for this, what's the maturity of it, what's the overhead of getting this started, uh, you know, if it's a three hundred thousand dollars, do you need to use the first one hundred and fifty to set up the program? Or I don't know. What. So maybe we should just, uh, you know, not make a choice today. But as I say, I'm supportive of some number here. 
uh, and then just bring it back for the near future. This fund is available for these one time discussions, uh, especially you know the state legislature. If we get some capital dollars for our project, the world's going to look different, and that's you know another six weeks away or seven weeks. Six. And I can schedule that for the board. Uh, Sherry Halt, who's been the, really the champion for this, has had some unexpected issues come up where she hasn't been able. She put, has been attending to provide more information, but uh, just hasn't been able to do so at this time. So that sets us up nicely for a, a discussion here in the weeks ahead. Yeah, maybe in the next two weeks or something. Yeah, I'll coordinate. Good. So then we'll be yeah, done with our allocations, knowing that uh, yeah, that that our that's our snapshot for now and. Uh, uh, you know, all the everybody's names in here knows what's coming, uh, and showing support for the affordable housing trust in some form in the scale we've discussed. Okay, it's, this is still going to be the most likely place that I would look for three, four, five hundred thousand um, dollars when when we talk about where we're going to get funding for that workforce housing. Um, that's fine. Right. Okay, so there's our spreadsheet for the year. Thank you, Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you so much. So that's it for our published agenda. Uh, we can go to other items. We have a few things, and then there's an executive session also. So go ahead with the script. Yeah. Let's go ahead and set up. Yep. Okay. Um, we can start with you. Go ahead. Um, this is the uh, CMS Federal Emergency Management. Yes. You can see the, the, bio, the biological opinion, the requesting out the total county uh, control letter. So I, I, I did provide this information to the commissioners this morning, but none of us had, well, I have had time to look at it in detail. I'm not sure if the commissioners had. So, if you could provide a bit of a, a snapshot of what the request is to refresh. Sure. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. Peter Gutowski, Community Development Director, and ideally Will Groves would be here, Planning Manager, who's also the floodplain coordinator. So what we what the board has received are a respectful template letter that was prepared by Tillamook County, and they've also have a, a, a law firm that they're working with. There's a, a PowerPoint presentation that was included, and this is involving uh, the Federal Emergency Management uh, Agency is currently doing an environmental re review through the National Environmental Policy Act pertaining to the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, tying to a biological opinion that stemmed from a lawsuit that originally occurred in the state of Washington and the state of Oregon that uh, stemmed from floodplain regulations not complying with uh, Section 7 consultation and the Endangered Species Act. And they, the, the biological opinion has found that floodplain regulations have been inappropriately administered that pose what's called jeopardy to anadromous fish as well as uh, uh, orcas that are in the Pacific Northwest. And what it has done for several counties on the, in the Oregon coast and then the Willamette Valley along the Columbia, not for Deschutes County because of Big Falls, which precludes naturally anadromous fish from upward migration and into the upper Deschutes. Um, and then Wyches Creek has, just to finish this off, Wyches Creek currently has a 10J designation for reintroduced steelhead, which are not, not subject to federal protection. What does this all mean? A lot of uh, Oregon counties that are affected by the biological opinion are really concerned about regulations that would be imposed from the federal government, these mandates, these mitigation requirements that can impact the way floodplain development occurs, uh, more stringent uh, development standards that would be applied, mitigation measures, and this template letter, which could be slightly revised to the extent that the board was supportive of introducing it during a public comment period that closes on May 5th, it would be done in an effort to support your uh, 
your colleagues at the, at the county level that are on the front lines of, 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 the, of this circumstance stemming from the biological opinion. So the letter, which has been drafted, again, speaks to socioeconomic impacts, the challenges of administering uh, these more stringent floodplain regulations in alignment with the Oregon land use system. Uh, measure 49 is referenced. You have potential concerns for taking legislation. And counties are really asking for, uh, have, are asking questions that are essentially asking the Federal Emergency Management Agency to slow down, to think about the types of uh, programmatic elements that could be imposed at the local level. It's a big deal. And you may recall at, at AOC um, last fall, I think there was a conversation about it. There's certainly one of your uh, cohorts, uh, County Commissioner from Tillamont County, uh, was, was making the rounds and spoke to the county sure planning director. Yes, thank you. So that's, that's the, the background. The public comment period now, as it pertains to uh, this environmental review again it closes on friday and so uh, that's why i kind of rushed with in coordination with, with with nick to see if this is something that you wanted to support in terms of a letter that uh reflects you know uh perspectives from deschutes county but certainly more supportive to those counties that are currently directly affected so I think we had supported this two to one in the past. Is that correct? And we have talked you about have, this. Yes. Yeah. And and since that time, I believe the only uh, feedback or input we've gotten from Deschutes County constituents about this issue has been opposed. As, as the, the, the local Trout Unlimited chapter, which represents hundreds several hundred issues county residents wrote us and said that they uh, did not think that we should be uh, involved in this issue because it doesn't a it doesn't affect issues county and b i mean you know i'll be but you know we want to get get way 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 into into water you know, water water resource management watershed and flooding issues um like i'll provide the perspective that um what, what, uh, what no fisheries action essentially does is it expands the area that is considered floodplain. Um, and that uh, aligns pretty well, actually, you know, like no fisheries is doing it for fisheries reasons, but it actually aligns pretty well with the, the climatic realities um, that we're facing um, hundred year floodplains were, were originally drawn with a very limited amount of, of um, um, uh, weather, you know, um, precipitation and uh, flood information. Um, and we've since learned that hundred year floodplain, the hundred year floodplains that we drew a long time ago uh, were really more like maybe 30 year floodplains and best 50 year floodplains. You know, in some cases we've seen you know, in, in, you know, many Western Oregon communities, they've seen, you know, 300 year floods in 10 years, for example, which is not supposed to happen. It's supposed to be every 100 years. Um, so uh, fighting against, uh, fighting against an expanded understanding of where floodplains are is fighting against the, the physical climatic realities and precipitation realities that Western Oregon faces. I think that they instead should be kind of recognizing that flooding is, is only going to get worse and that they've underestimated where, uh, you know, where floodplains are in the past and that they should then turn around and be asking the state to help them um, move businesses and residences and you know, incorporated areas and other things out of floodplains and asking the state for flexibility to put that stuff somewhere else where it's safer. Um, that would be a much more proactive uh, thing to do rather than burying your head in the sand and pretending that flooding doesn't exist. But I will say, I will just circle back. Well, we're not going to get 
I will just circle back again and say that the only Deschutes County constituents I am aware of that we've heard from about this have, have urged us not to uh, get involved. So we've got uh, big flooding issues coming because of climate change and, and there's advocacy well, we, for we, not developing because of lack of water. Well, there's climate change, but also the hundred year floodplains that we drew were drawn on a tiny amount of climatic and precipitation data. And now that we actually have 20, 30, 40 more years of, of real data, they're saying like, oh, the hundred year floodplain is actually much bigger. Than it was, than we thought it was, because we get big weather events more often. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, like I said, there's there's places in there's places in Western Oregon that have had three hundred year floods in a ten year period. Well, I'm from Hebner, and we had the flood in 1903, and it took the government a hundred years plus to put in the Willow Creek Dam. So, anyway, that was my family's personal recollection of it. A major flood. Well, 151 people died. So the back of this uh, yeah, talks so about letting people put themselves in harm's way is actually a really good idea in the first place. Well, it took the government over 100 years to build something, so I was a, I was I was pretty fast. And if you know where if you know where people are going to be in harm's way, then asking them to uh, or helping them build their home, their business, whatever somewhere else is actually a really smart thing to do, which will save you money in the long run. So on the back page of this presentation, we were provided talks about Oregon NFIP buyout action area, and it does show eastern side of Deschutes County and all of County. Uh, so I don't have a feel for what this, what this is relative to this implementation, but I mean, we just happen to be in a footprint of a action area. There's no streams in in that, in that side of, of yeah, the, as mentioned, the, because of Big Falls, um, which is right at our county border, it, it, it's a natural barrier that precludes upward migration. But you're not wrong that Crooked, that Crook County is affected because of Ochico. Um, and the uh, Prineville Reservoir is like 80% filled all of a sudden. I mean, it was like 30% just a week and a half ago. And it's pretty, must be going up real fast right now. The, the, I think if you were going to boil it down to the essence, there's a cons concerns by your, your fellow county commissioners that, uh, that um, are in affected counties that there's going to be a top down approach from the federal government on, on, on floodplain regulations, mitigation measures, and local governments need to be participating in the National Flood Insurance Program. And so, I mean, they can choose to opt out of the NFIP, but in doing so, if there's a flood, they, 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 their, their constituents are not protected with you know, federal insurance. And so um, it's, Oh, it, it's just I, I know at AOC and all three commissioners experience it that there's there's just a, a real anxiety from those counties um, that have anadromous fish uh, and, and and the worry that this program what this program could, could do in especially cities um, where most of the fertile ground during the settlement patterns were built in the floodplain there's a lot of rural communities that are in the floodplain um and and so that's what's before you it's just whether or not in a supporting role you want to articulate uh you know this 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 support as noted in the in the draft letter i i i to the extent that there is support i would i would recommend removing the first bullet point because deschutes county isn't affected by it but it could be written in a way as it is kind of supporting the you know those counties that are that are that are really impacted by by this biological opinion of this currently this environmental review. So is this, uh, you said Oregon and Washington, uh, is that kind of the only footprint affected? That's my, I don't think it's, I think California may have been subject to a different lawsuit, but it started in Washington County by an environmental organization that prevailed in court by showing that the Federal Emergency Management Agency was when, as it pertained to administering the floodplain program, was not undertaking Section 7 consultation 
with with floodplain permits and whatnot as it pertains to when you're when you're doing section seven consultation you're looking at threatened or endangered species they prevailed in in washington and it didn't take too long for an oregon conservation organization to raise the same concerns in oregon and i, I think that's noted earlier in the powerpoint can you comment on how far this program has progressed with implementation in washington state I I am not I, I am I'm under not the impression aware. that I am under the impression that they are five years into this already, and um, if if people in Oregon think that uh, the federal government is going to do something in Washington State and then when confronted with um, resistance to doing the exact same thing in Oregon that we're going to we're special and we're going to they're going to get they're going to do something different for us there. Uh, in my opinion, being very nice. So I, I go back to kind of just our statewide land use system. And I think we're already acknowledging, you know, floodplain, and we've got uh, you know, the maps that we publish here at Deschutes County, and uh, you know, people delineate those more as development is proposed. Um, you know, the statewide land use system, I think, would be the. I was going to try to say belt and suspenders, but it would be at least the belt holding it all up. So now the Fed's going to come in with another support and say okay we're going to study it more so i mean philosophically I, the one they're, they're, not, they're not going to study it more they're going to pull they're going to pull in uh, they're going to pull flood coverage uh in communities that aren't essentially being mindful of, of where uh, flood things are yeah, it is the potential to lead to additional regulations mitigation measures that this that the federal government finds are suitable to address the floodplain function and if local governments resist they then the federal government will say well you're no longer eligible for the national flood insurance program and yeah, that's where that. that's when you know they, yeah. they local governments feel like they're well they're they're, they're held hostage so how about uh i you know, we've taken two of us have taken a position of showing support, but I, this is a little too technical for me. I don't know that I'm supportive of trying to write a letter because I don't know the content that I would be able to defend. It's and it just frankly irrelevant to issues county. So, any thoughts, Commissioner? But it's relevant to our state, and if you're saying it could be relevant to Kirk County, um, maybe I'll talk to some Kirk County experts and see what they say. What's, what's their position? So, yeah, I mean, they about if it? you want to take it a little farther, as right. I say, I've already shown the support in camaraderie for the state, uh, but I would need some content. I don't, I, I'm not capable of bringing up. What statements would be in a letter? I don't know. And just again to remind the board that there's this uh, scoping comment letters are due May 5th, so which is a Friday. Friday. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, to the extent, uh, I don't know okay. how you. Just yeah. how you navigate that. No action to Okay, great. Thank you very much. You can write individual letters if you want. Thank you for your time. It's not right here. I mean, commissioners can send an individual letter. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, that's what. Yeah, this is it. Yeah, so that's a good discussion. Okay, another. Uh, yeah, then the next item are the Association of Oregon Counties uh, Annual Dues. Um, we have uh, maybe about $69,000. I missed the exact balance, but uh, $69,419.19. Yeah. Thank you. I brought the memo. Perfect. And I did know that you, last year they were, uh, it's okay. they were asked to cut it back by, um, you know, uh, President Murdoch. And they, he did, they did come back with their budget last, a year ago, $150,000. And they did the same thing again this year. So they are trying to. And then we actually am on the, membership committee and they're reaching out to um, businesses in the community and actually getting underwriting funding from them on a more significant nature than they've ever got before. So they're hoping that next year's bills were, will be maybe even less. So this is Association of Oregon Counties uh, available to all counties. Uh, this is our legislative uh, lobbying efforts, uh, position of local government, the counties, uh, but, very supportive of being a member again. So uh, it's really hard watching uh, uh, you know, the annual dues go up, but there's serious 
a scrutiny internal to the organization about what are we really need to do and where are we going to go with this. So uh, as to say that the calculated bill is that $69,000 number. Uh, and this, so it's a, it'll be a minute's motion to pay this bill because it's, it's, it's kind of lobbying membership uh, contract. And the good news is Gina actually has been appointed to a national committee over behavioral health. You know, that's her area of expertise. So she is going to DC this week to work on that, which is um, outstanding, her expertise. So I move uh, paying the annual invoice from AOC of $69,419.19. I'll Okay, there we go. Any other discussion? Uh, seeing that, Commissioner Dare. Yes. Commissioner Chen. Yes, we chair votes, yes. Yeah. Procedurally, might be helpful. Is it helpful to the board that we bring this invoice to you under other items each year? Was that, is that something? Sure, sure. Well, I mean, yeah, I think we definitely, the number every year is, you know, it's been changing. And, uh, yeah, we need to acknowledge it. I mean, <clears throat> if I'm tracking correctly, you know, they're, they're making a significant jump this year, but then, um, should stabilize. I mean, <laughs> they're not going to have to make a jump this big each year. Um, you know, according to their long-term financial projections, so um, we're just getting to a point where they have a sustainable organization. And if it's not changing a huge amount between this year and next year, I don't. I, I don't know if we have to see it in. The... Oh, I want to see. It's a, yeah, we should say it. And we should know that we're paying our bills timely. It's rather embarrassing if we go to the meeting and we're on the block list. We could be right up there at the top. Well, well you see what happened. They emailed it to Commissioner Adair as the chair, but I'm the chair, so like we got lost. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. It's all good. I think they should be focusing uh, intensive attention on counties that don't participate in AOC. Oh yeah, we're there every month. Yep, somebody's in the room. So yeah, but I hadn't even heard about this really. I had you know, I think I did see an email originally. Oh good. Okay. Uh, any other item? Um, speaking of AOC, I just wanted to uh, let my fellow commissioners know that um, I will not be in person at either the May or the June legislative, AOC legislative meetings. I will be at, in the May meeting virtually, um, but in June, I will be gone. I will be out of the office that, that entire week. I'll be, on, I'll be out of the office on Friday, the, you know, the Friday before on the 9th, and I'll be out of the office on, on I guess that'll be the 12th. So if someone else is interested in, in uh, representing Deschutes County on, on June 12th, then I assume that that's the way it works. We can uh, designate someone else from the county. Can we? Or is that like the legislative? Right, the legislative meeting. Do we have I'm an alternate? Sure. I mean, it's, it's our Do county. we have a voting alternate? That's what we need to find out, Brenda. I mean, it's, it's our counties. I know. It's going to be the right. end of the session. I don't know that there's going to be. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, who knows? Yeah, it could be the most exciting moment. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, we we don't tend to track the, the money stuff very closely, but um, that's when a lot of real exciting stuff is going to be happening in terms of in terms of money. But then again, we we don't necessarily need to be. Uh, if that's a lot of individual lobbying on our part uh, with legislators, so that's not necessarily something we're doing with AOC either. Yeah. Well, yeah so, I, and I don't know what the processes for alternate on that. Uh, I've, you know, I've attended some committee meetings and then I've been in the room for the legislative meetings, but I haven't felt the need to, you know, it's just, it is what it is at that point. Yeah, no, but I, I'll, I, I will be at the main meeting. Okay. I just won't, you won't see me in the room. So uh, it doesn't mean I'm not there. Well, I already committed, I believe, to going to dinner on the 15th in Salem with the county college group for the membership committee. So I don't know if you want to go on the 12th or not a person. I probably won't get ready for a family wedding. Oh, well, that's right. You're getting a new wedding. So maybe I could go to Salem and stay there then. Wait, right? <laughs> well, and brother. If, and if we didn't have anyone there, it does just sound tragedy. Well, no, uh, we'll see. Okay, okay so. Because it is the end of the session. Okay, so June 12th, 
right. So another note, I was able to attend the Chamber Annual Banquet in Pine, Chamber of Commerce Annual Banquet last Saturday. Uh, it's exciting. So the, the Gil Martinez Award is the uh, Community Service Award, and it was given to uh, Bo DeForest, who was the football and baseball coach out of Lapine. And he had gone to school there originally. His dad was a coach when he was in school. He came back and became the coach. He really shepherded a whole cohort of kids. When his, his So the kids that were his, his kids' age, in fact, my son was one of them, I think, between their ages. Um, but yeah, just celebrated that, you know, 15 year run of, of being involved in the schools and sports and everything. So it's really exciting. A kind of special moment. And then they didn't have enough people to, to man some of the gaming tables because there's a company that brought in blackjack. So I ended up being a celebrity roulette table or something or whatever you call them. Man, I was over my head. I don't think I gave away too many chips though. So that was that. Oh, I did. I had the privilege of meeting the interim director of um, Oregon Health Authority at my um, LGAC meeting on Friday morning. It was wonderful. He was there. A couple other people that should have been there were on Zoom, and they all said they should have been in person, or all things should be in person. I'm thinking, like, well, you're the people that aren't in this room, but um, it was great. Um, some really good things were pointed out, and he's very well aware of Deer Ridge, the possibilities there, and um, you know, the help we need. So it was uh, a good meeting. I guess the, the one other thing I would report back is that uh, on Friday, uh, a little bit on Friday afternoon, and then on Saturday, I participated in an early learning conference um, and uh, you know, was, was invited to uh, moderate one of the panels at, at that conference. And, made sure that um, a number of people who we have worked with on ARPA allocations for child care funding were aware that um, the deadlines to, to, to be putting, you know, putting money to work on projects are, are, are coming up um, and that they should be making sure that their, you know, that their projects are, are moving along. Um, kind of, Got a good report back on the OSU Cascades, the, the little kids project, um, which sounds like they, they just secured an additional piece of federal funding. And they're going to be able to move ahead pretty soon. But um, other projects, uh, well, I also heard about, I heard some more, uh, a little bit more of an update on the Mountain Star project that we invested in. But um, other projects, maybe not so far along. People got the heads up. Okay. Anything else? Oh, the good news was at the core presentation, Jackie actually said that they got their, I think, the go ahead for the Simpson property, and it's now 40 cottages. You know, originally it was only 30, and they're keeping all the trees on the exterior. So, great news. And I think seven um, houses are going in on the popular. Poplar uh, Street that we were at for the, for the groundbreaking. Yeah, yeah. For Simpson, they 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 got they got the, the formal approval from the Oregon uh, from OHCS. So that plus five hundred thousand dollars from the, the MPO for some of the transportation improvements and some other pieces of funding have all come together. And it sounds like they are going to start on work real soon. Okay, so seeing no other updates, we'll go to an executive session. This will be uh, your real property. Switch gears. Is there a different Zoom? Or we're just stopping? It's going to be the 